And we'll also do some definite integrals in this section as well. But first, let's go ahead and start with an integral that looks like this. 3x squared, x cubed plus 1, all raised to the 1 half power. Uh, actually, to the 12th power. That's what I'm trying to do here. To the 12th power uh, dx. All right, so again, we want to try to find a substitution. So you start looking around, and as we've seen a lot, we try to first look and see things that are wrapped up raised to powers or inside of square roots. We'll try that. If we set this equal to u, then the derivative of this will be 3x squared. And looky here, that's what we have out front. So you start to see these patterns um, after a while. That's probably the right answer for the substitution. u is equal to x cubed plus 1, so then du dx is 3x squared, and then dx is equal to 1 over 3x squared du. So that is our uh, information we need to go ahead and substitute in, so let's see what happens. We have the integral of 3x squared. This resolves to u to the 12th power, because this is what we define to be uh, equal to u. And then for dx, we have this guy, 1 over 3x squared du. So it's certainly looking good. 3x squared cancels with 3x squared. And so finally we have the integral of u to the 12th power plus, I should say, not plus times du, or integrated over du. So this is very simple. It's just a simple polynomial. So it's 1 over the exponent plus 1, which is 13, u to the exponent plus 1, which is 13, plus a constant. So 1 over 13, u we've defined to be x cubed plus 1, so open the parentheses, uh, and we'll say that's x cubed plus 1 to the 13th power plus a constant, and this is the answer. 1 over 13, x cubed plus 1 to the 13th power plus a constant. So you see, these problems, to be honest with you, they're not really any harder. They're not uh, suddenly, you know, these graduate level substitution problems that you can't do. They're just giving you practicing different ways in which the integrals are arranged to give you practice. So let's finally do one with some limits. So let's say this is the integral of from minus 1 to 3 of sine of pi x dx. And again, you might be tempted just to write the answer down because you know what the integral of sine is. And that's true, you do know what the integral of sine of x is, but you don't know off the top of your head what sine of pi times x is. Because this is not sine of x, this is sine of pi times x. So you, you, you cannot just uh, write down the answer without doing a quick substitution. So let's make it, let's put it into a form that we know. So u will be pi times x, right? So then du dx will just be equal to, take this derivative, we just get pi. So then dx will just equal 1 over pi du, just solving for dx. So when we stick all this stuff in here, hopefully we'll get an integral that we know how to solve. So negative 1 to 3 of sine of what? Sine of u. dx is equal to 1 over pi du. So everything's in terms of u and du, which is exactly what we want to see. This 1 over pi doesn't matter at all because it can come out of the integral. So what happens is we have 1 over pi. What is the integral of sine? What is the integral of sine? Integral of sine, if you remember back, we just talked about it, is negative cosine u. That's what the integral is. Integral of sine is negative cosine. So we've done the integration. So let's write a reminder to ourselves that we want to eventually plug in the limits of integration from negative 1 to 3, but this original integral was in terms of x. So when we talk about these limits of integration, it's from x is equal to negative 1 up to x is equal to positive 3. So we cannot substitute these limits in here because this answer is in terms of u. You'll get the wrong answer if you substitute right now. So let's plug in what we know for u and then substitute our limits of integration back in. So what we'll have is negative 1 over pi, okay, times the cosine of u, but u is equal to pi times x. Now we can evaluate from negative 1 up to 3, because this is all in terms of x. All right, so let's switch colors to make it a little bit easier. And you have to be very explicit when you plug these things in. So I'm going to do 1 over pi, because that's kind of sitting out in front. And then I'm going to open a giant bracket, and I'm going to do everything inside of these brackets. Okay? 
So what I have uh, is I'm going to have, actually what I'll do, just to make it even easier, since this problem is, is really not too complicated here, is I'll plug in the upper limit first and then the lower limit. So what I have here, opening a bracket, negative one over pi times the cosine of pi times three, just plugging in for this, close the bracket, minus, now I've got to evaluate at the lower limit of integration, negative one over pi times the cosine of pi times negative one. So in other words, a negative pi inside. I just plug it in exactly the way it sits, okay? And let's see what we get here. So what we have is negative one over pi. What is the cosine of three pi? If you think of your unit circle kind of imagining here, this is zero, this is pi, this is two pi, then three pi is gonna be back pointing to the left. So you have pi, two pi, which is back full circle, three pi, pointing back again to the left. What's the cosine of that over there? Cosine of that, since it's on this side, is negative one. If that seems confusing to you, you need to go back and review your trig. I've got lots of materials to help you with that. Negative one over pi here in the second bracket. What is the cosine of negative pi? If this is zero here, negative pi would be going down and over here. So really it's pointing at exactly the same place, and so you still get a negative one, okay? So just simplifying this here, what we have here, this makes a positive one over pi minus, and then what we get over here, this also makes a positive one over pi. So what I get is a one over pi here, I get a one over pi here, but I'm subtracting. So really all I get is zero, and that is the answer. And sometimes that happens, uh, that happens sometimes in integration. Sometimes you just do a lot of work and you just get zero, or you do a lot of work and you just get one as an answer, and that's sometimes just the way it falls out. Now you might ask yourself, how can I get zero for the area under this curve from negative one to three? How is it possible? Well, when you remember, we talked about this, any area that's above the x-axis is treated as positive. Any area that's below the x-axis is treated as negative. So, if you were to graph this, and if you were to look from negative one to three, then what you would see is that half of the area between those two boundaries is below the x-axis, and the other half of the area is above the x-axis. So when you do an integral across the whole boundary, it's algebraically summing the positive and negative portions of the area, and so you can't actually get zero, even though the function's a real function, and you know it's, you know, it's not just flat line, you know it's something there. Half of the area must be positive, half the area must be negative. That's actually a good exercise for you to go check out and prove to yourself. Okay, so let's go ahead and do another problem here. And this last problem will also have limits of integration, just to kind of give you practice with that. So what if we have integral zero to pi by four, and what we're gonna get is sine of z over cosine squared of z dz. Again, z is a dummy variable, it doesn't matter. This is a, uh, a definite integral from zero to pi over four. So whatever happens, we're going to get an answer and then we're gonna plug in the upper limit of integration minus the lower limit of integration, so we're going to get a number for the answer. The actual letter that you're using doesn't matter at all. It's a dummy integration because you're just gonna get a number in the end anyway. So, how can we do this? What should we do? Well, we know we have cosine squared on the bottom. If, for whatever reason, if we chose cosine of z to be u, the derivative of cosine is, what? Negative sine, right? And that sine just might cancel with the sine that we have on top, so it might simplify our integral. That's the thought process you go through. I'm trying to share with you my thought process so that you can develop your own. So u, let's say it's just equal to cosine of z du dz, derivative of cosine is negative sine of z. And so then if you solve for dz, you get negative sine z du. And that's what we're going to use to plug into this guy. So what we'll have is the integral from zero to pi over four. We'll have sine of z on the top. On the bottom, we had cosine squared um, but we're defining u to be cosine, so really what we have on the bottom is u squared, okay? And then the dz we've just defined to be negative sine of z du.
and you know you immediately notice a problem. You do not have any cancellation and you did expect it. And to be honest with you, you know, I could actually edit this portion of the video out if I wanted to, but I really want to show you that, you know, it mistakes happen to the best of us. And you can see if you were paying attention that I actually made a mistake here. Because when you when you substitute all this in in a perfect world, you should get a cancellation. And I didn't get a cancellation, so I'm guessing I did something wrong. So I go back up here and I look and I see that this was all correct, but when I solve for dz, it's not e actually equal to this. It's actually equal to um, 1 over sine of z d mu. And that makes a huge difference. It's still a negative here. If I put the dz over here and then I divide to get all of this stuff, it's going to look like this. That's going to totally change what I have inside of here, right? So that's not going to be this. It's going to be negative 1 over sine of z. Right, so it's good ahead, ahead of time to kind of plan your attack like I've been showing you. And that way, when you make a mistake, which can happen to any of us, uh, you know, you will realize that. So those cancellations now happen. All right, and so here what you have is negative integral from 0 to pi by 4. This is 1 over u squared, but I'm going to write it as u to the negative 2 because I like to keep it in terms of polynomials. Uh, that are, you know, not as fractions, okay? And I'm going to integrate this guy. I know how to integrate this, right? The integral of u, of u to the negative 2, I'm going to have negative 1 over exponent plus 1, negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1. u to the negative 1, I'm adding 1 to the exponent. And I need to evaluate it from 0 to pi over 4, but I can't do it yet because I still have my answer in terms of u. So, let's go ahead and fix that. So this is going to be a positive, positive 1, it's just going to drop out. This u is actually defined to be cosine z, right? It's going to be defined to be cosine z. And I have u to the negative 1. So really what I'm going to have is 1 over cosine z evaluated from 0 to pi over 4. Make sure you understand that. Everything in front disappears because it's positive. I have u to the minus 1. u is cosine, so it's cosine z to the minus 1. I just write it like this. I could have kept it like this. But when I'm doing my final calculations, I just like to have the fractions there. It's kind of a personal preference thing. So now all we have to do is evaluate 1 over cosine of pi over 4 minus 1 over cosine of 0. Top limit of integration minus the bottom limit of integration. So what we have here, 1 over, what is cosine pi over 4? It's the square root of 2 over 2, minus 1 over. What's the cosine of 0? Cosine of 0 is 1. So now we have something that looks nice. So I can flip this guy over, and what I will get is 2 over the square root of 2 minus 1. And this is perfectly fine, in my opinion, to circle on a test or a quiz. This is the answer. I mean, you want to keep it in exact form. You don't want decimals in, in these questions and the answers to these questions, so that's fine. But some teachers really dislike seeing square roots on the bottom of fractions, right? Kind of a tradition thing. So the way you get around it is you multiply this guy by the following. You'll have 2 over square root of 2. And what I can do is I can multiply him by the square root of 2 over the square root of 2. Because when you multiply by root of 2 over root of 2, you're just multiplying by 1. You still have the minus 1 out here. And so what you're going to have for a final answer, you'll have 2 times the square root of 2 on the top. Here you'll have square root of 2 times square root of 2, which will be square root of 4. Square root of 4 is 2. So you'll have a 2 on the bottom, and you'll have a minus 1. Once you have it in this form, the 2 will cancel with this, so you'll have the square root of 2 minus 1. So this is the answer, or you can write it as this, in my opinion, but some people like to write it as square root of 2 minus 1. So, this problem is a great little problem. You look at the original problem and you're like, how can I substitute? And you say, well, if I choose cosine, then I should get a derivative that involves sine and I should cancel. But as we saw in this problem, if you're not even careful in the tiniest little step, then you won't get your cancellation. And then on test, that's going to really rob you of time. So, when I noticed that, I went back and I said, well, clearly I made a mistake here. We fix this guy, we get our cancellation, we know how to integrate this, so we integrate it. The limits of integration we can't plug in until we convert back to our original variable. Then we evaluate the trig, so there's a little bit of trig in here. This is the answer, but a lot of people don't like square roots and the denominators are fractions, so to get rid of it, it's called multiplying by the conjugate. Basically, anytime you multiply 
something, if you have a root in the bottom, if you multiply by a root over a root, so here we're multiplying by one, you're guaranteed just to get a number in the bottom because it's square root of four, which becomes a two. Then you can do a cancellation. And so this guy numerically is actually equal to what we have above. If you put both of these in the calculator, you're gonna get the same exact decimal. And give it a shot if you wanna check that out. So we have learned in these last several sections the most important part of calculus in terms of integration, in my opinion, other than the basic idea and the basic integrals, the most important technique of integration that you'll ever learn is what we've been doing here, which is substitution. You can use it for a wide array of problems. And what you're really trying to do is you're trying to uh, figure out how to transform your integral into a simpler one that you know how to solve. And there's certain rules that you need to apply, and we've learned what those are, and we've getting, gotten a lot of practice. So make sure you can do every single one of these problems yourself. If you can't reproduce it yourself on your own paper, then you don't, you don't fully understand it, and you haven't fully internalized it. So don't just watch this stuff. Make sure you can do them yourself, and then follow me on to the next several sections. You know, we've got a lot of material left to cover. We have, so far, talked about integrating polynomials and integrating trig functions, right? Um, but we haven't talked anything at all about, you know, exponentials and we haven't talked about logarithms and there's lots of other things out there in terms of integrals that are going to become very, very important. So follow me on to the next section where we will continue talking about these things and these other types of functions in terms of integration in calculus. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.